The episode you are about to hear contains graphic descriptions of sexual abuse involving children, possible cult ritual abuse, and the effects of those acts on the victims involved. I'm bringing light to these horrific cases to make it known to the world that these crimes against children have and still do exist and need to be stopped. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome back to Rogue Darkness, the podcast that uncovers how misinterpretations and misinformation surrounding witchcraft, the occult, and other beliefs have led many to do unthinkable crimes. From cults and ritualistic killings, to brainwashing and extremist beliefs of the world around us, let's explore the darkness of mankind, one crime at a time. I'm your host of The Grim and Gruesome, Raven. Let's go rogue and get right into today's chilling crime, the case of the alleged Hampstead Satanic Sex Cult. Now, I had originally discussed this case on my other podcast, but wanted to bring it back and sort of revive it on here since it's definitely a heavy one and there's so much controversy surrounding this case. I'm going to be giving you all possible sides to this story since there's always three sides to any story. There's side A, side B, and then there's the truth. I'll provide as much information as possible to help you determine which side is or possibly is the actual truth. But in all honesty, it's still heavily debated to this day due to the lack of evidence and a presumably prematurely closed police investigation. So with that said, I'm going to first discuss the accusations against the cult itself, and then I'll go over the main person who was being accused and his side. Please keep in mind, whichever side was the truth, both sides of this case are extremely demented, and regardless of which is the actual truth, Both of them involve horrific acts against children. Now, many of you know that satanic cults have and do still exist, even if they are under the radar. As mentioned in my last episode, there's a huge difference between Satanism, modern-day Satanists or Levian Satanists, and devil worshippers. Most times when you hear about the quote-unquote satanic cults, it's generally referring to actual devil worshippers and not what most people who call themselves Satanists are, which is more more or less atheists. Many cults coin the name Satanic, so I'll be using that term throughout, but just remember there is a difference between modern-day Satanism and devil worshippers. So I just wanted to put that little reminder out there for you. Just keep that in mind. But today I'll be going over a supposed satanic sex cult which was based out of Hampstead, England around 2014, so it happened not too long ago. A lot of the specifics of this case and the validity of the cult itself is still unknown and unconfirmed to this day. So please keep an open mind and try to decipher for yourselves whether or not you think the actions described actually took place or instead the children involved were coached to say the horrific things that you'll soon hear. To start things off, let's go over the people involved in this horrifying case, starting with the children. At the time of the alleged abuse, 8-year-old Gabriel Dearman and his 9-year-old sister Elisa were seen in numerous videos surfacing online, where they recounted horrific and gruesome acts performed by their father, Ricky Dearman, along with his alleged satanic cult that was based out of the children's primary school in Hampstead. Gabriel and Elisa's parents, English-born Ricky Dearman, their father, and Russian-born Ella Gariva, and you'll also hear her known as Ella Draper, but Ella Gariva, Ella Draper, same woman, that's their mother, they were separated due to alleged sexual deviancy, abuse, and violence projected by Ricky, their father, onto Ella. And sometimes it was actually reported that he did abuse the children as well. Whether or not that's accurate, there's debate there, but There has been some reports stating that he did sometimes get abusive with the mother for sure and possibly the children at times. After the parents' separation, Ricky was known to stalk the children and Ella, making unannounced visits to their home and demanding to see the children. Other times, he would show up at their school to pay them a visit. When the stalking became too much, Ella proceeded to file an emergency court order and a non-molestation order in an attempt to protect Gabriel and Elisa from their father. 
This order unfortunately only lasted for eight months and then was dropped. After the orders expired, Ella sent Elisa to Russia to stay with her parents in an attempt to try and keep her out of harm's way. Not sure why she only sent Elisa instead of both kids, but that is what was noted in the interviews with Ella at the time. So it could have just been a typo on the journalist's end, but I'm not sure. Why, why she would send one child and not the other, that makes no sense. Ricky Dearman counteracted Ella's restraining orders with filing suit for a dual custody contract since he felt he had equal rights to see his kids just as much as their mother did. But much to Ella's dismay, though, the court ultimately granted approval of the contract, allowing Ricky to see the children on a regular basis, starting off with every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Ella mentioned how the dual custody was not going well, and that when Ricky was watching the kids, he would oftentimes return them home much later than the 6 p.m. curfew, and many times he would feed the kids unhealthy food and junk food, while Ella insisted on them eating a whole foods and vegan diet. So you can see the parents had very different approaches to the kids' eating habits. So that alone would cause conflict. According to Ella, Gabriel and Elisa were often sick after staying with their father and would many times vomit with side effects of persistent headaches and stomach aches. Ella correlated their sickness with the types of food that Ricky was feeding them. The ongoing bouts of sickness were just the beginning, though. Ella had begun dating a man named Abraham Christie, and from there, the darkness of this case really started to take form. On one occasion, Abraham apparently caught the children sexually touching themselves as well as one of their pet dogs. This led Abraham to begin interrogating the children regarding the issue, and he then proceeded to video record the kids talking about horrific events, including child abuse, sexual abuse, ritualistic sacrifice of babies, and cannibalism that apparently took place at their school, the Christchurch Primary School in Hampstead under the leadership of their father, Ricky Dearman. Their accusations led many to believe he was the head leader of a satanic sex cult, based out of the school, where diabolical acts that seemed too evil for any human to commit took place, and which Gabriel and Elisa witnessed firsthand. I'm now going to play a few short clips of both Gabriel and Elisa, where they recount some of the supposed abuse they faced while under their father's care and at the hands of the supposed cult. What you are about to hear is extremely shocking and is meant for mature audiences only, so I highly, highly suggest you wear headphones if you have children around or are in a public area. This cult is because when we, the first time whenever we ever did, done it, did what? First like we, first ever we saw Papa kill first, a baby and me and, and, and we and Gabriel done, he's the boss of, what? of the whole, whole thing. Of the what? Boss of what? Of the whole cult. The whole, the whole Peter Falls what, what do they do in this car? They do sex there, they kill babies. Sex to who? They do sex to children, they do to every, each other, each other. And what are the babies for? What do you get the, the babies? The babies, we said so the social services to do it, unfortunately. They get the babies from families who can't, can't look after the baby and who don't want the baby. Really? Yes. Sometimes, Social services, I find that difficult to believe. Yes. What well, then? Richie. Richie who? Richie who? Richie, I don't know his surname, but it's Richie. His the name's... one who came to our home. He's your school. particular social, he's your social service, he's a worker that helps Yes, you. and Ella, the other lady who first... Quality, time, quality. Quality. Yes, she came to our house in 47 Lane, so 47 Holycroft Avenue. One second, one second. And, and then the social services, they get babies from other families. So, like, say if the family can't afford a baby, so if they got a baby but they can't look after it or anything like that, so if they get a baby, they, they want give a baby. The, who do they give the baby to? They sell the baby they, or just they, give them? they don't just give them, they sell it because they can't really. If they sometimes give, but they don't like just give it like just give it like borrow like for like like a rent. They give it away because sometimes families are just part poor. So like in like in uh, Tanja, there are people who uh, who had bay children and they were really poor. They couldn't afford food for them. So if the families not can't ha doesn't have money and they get a baby, they sell it. Babies? They eat it. Do sex How first. How do they eat the baby? They cut. Alive? Is the baby alive? No, they inject it to make it go to sleep. And, and then? And then after, Papa tells us to hold the knife and then he puts his big hand on 
he puts you, it pushes the, it into the neck, cuts it, and after, but when well, it's upside down, so it's like, he goes like So how does the baby become upside down? So you get a string, hang it up, and it's upside down when it's asleep. Well, well, hang the baby upside down after they inject it? Yes. Miss Margin, the nurse, she Miss Margin? Miss Margin is a nurse of our school. She does the injecting, she does, she pretends to be kind, kind to my mom, and tries to, like, say, be kind, and then after, she just, uh, she injects, she's the nurse, so she pretends to be kind to mom, and she just, she, so if me and Gabe, if I hurt myself, she pretends to be, like, really kind to us, and, like, look after us, and give us ice. She's a member of this cult? Yes. She's the and what do they all have? You say they all have a special something that they wear and stuff. Yes, they wear this, but they wear this uh, special kind of shoes. They make out what shoes? What shoes, kind of shoes? Baby skin shoes. Big church, and we use it for sex, eating baby, drinking baby's blood. We kill, we sacrifice the baby. We do sex to the baby. We throw the when we're dancing with the skulls after the babies are what dead. Skulls? What skulls? The baby skulls. We from put, before. Yeah, from before. We put it on. Where do the baby skulls come from? They come from the baby. How do you get them from the baby? We cut the baby's head off, we, um, then we clear all the meat from the skulls, and then we um, put all the meat and cook it, sometimes we roast it, sometimes we roast it in the oven, sometimes we cook it on a fire. You, you told me there's some restaurants. Yeah, and there's some restaurants, in the McDonald's in Hampstead, and East Finchley, and East Finchley is a... Is a, East Finchley is a swimming pool, and in the East Finchley there's a swimming pool, and the whole, um, whole the whole East Finchley does it. The boss does it. Everybody does it. But what? The sex. So from what you just heard, you can tell how horrible the accusations against Ricky Dearman were. Whether they were factual or fiction, the horrors that Gabriel and Elisa mentioned are things that no child should ever know exists. Yet here they are disclosing the acts of abuse and ritual sacrifice in extremely vivid detail. In September 2014, Ella provided the video footage to the Barnett Police Department, which then opened up the case and began the investigation. Both children were interviewed separately as a means to hear both of their stories and experiences. From the audio played, you can hear both Gabriel and Elise's experiences and how throughout the interrogation they stick to their original stories the ones they stated in the videos taken by Abraham Christie, accusing their father of Satanism and ritual abuse. After the interrogations through the police, a medical examination was ordered and performed on the children. The examination concluded that both the children had in fact been sexually abused, with severe tearing and injuries to the inside of their rectums. On September 11, 2014, both Gabriel and Elisa were taken into protective custody. On September 17th, their mother Ella was notified by the police that both the children had retracted their statements and the claims of abuse against their father and the other people involved, claiming that Ella's boyfriend Abraham was actually the person who was the abuser and that he had coached them to say such horrible things against their father. The Barnett Police Department proceeded to close the case solely based on the retraction of the claims, as well as the fact that certain details about the location of the abuse turned up to be false. In some additional footage, Elisa recounts how some of the sacrificial rituals of babies took place in public restaurants, including a McDonald's where the manager was apparently part of the cult. These claims were deemed fabricated by the investigators and concluded to be false. Using a large corporation name like McDonald's and saying such horrible crimes were committed there is huge. So once that claim was looked into and determined ultimately false, the whole validity of the children's initial claims became much less likely and unbelievable in the investigators' eyes, which is why they ultimately ended up closing the case earlier than some would have hoped. Despite the closing of the case, there had been much speculation on whether or not the case was closed prematurely and without complete and thorough investigating. A witness statement was placed by retired police constable referred to as K. Wilson, where he gives his opinion on the case and why it should be looked into further. Here is the statement filed by Wilson. To state categorically that the children had been coached, which I understand is the assertion from social services, is simply not feasible. Some investigation has not been conducted into proving or disproving, however most appear to be slanted towards the merely disproving the offenses occurred. This investigation does not look at the fact that the children are giving accounts of abuse, 
and how they came to use such language other than to suggest that Mr. Christie coached the children. Other named suspects who are professionals were not formally interviewed. Investigators should not make assumptions that due to the unlikely or seemingly ridiculous nature of the allegation that it is untrue. If an account appears to be untrue, corroboration should be sought for this also. I do not feel it was suitable to close this investigation at this point without further inquiries and corroboration being sought. So as you can tell from this response by a first-hand account who was involved in this case, the case was clearly prematurely closed and not enough investigation was done to conclude whether or not the accusations were true or false. Both the accusations against the father, Ricky Dearman, as well as the accusations of coaching by Abraham Christie, both of those should have been looked into further to assure no stone was left unturned. Throughout the beginning of and through the closure of the investigation, both Gabriel and Elisa were placed in custody of Child Welfare Services, so they were taken away from both the mother and the father until justice was served, or at least in their eyes it was served. Between September and December of 2014, there were three court hearings held where both Ricky and Ella fought the case and both held their ground on each of their sides of the story. Ultimately, due to the retracting of the children's initial abuse claims and the fact that a lot of what they were claiming seemed fabricated and outlandish, the court decided in favor of Ricky Dearman and released the children to him, with whom the kids have remained to this day. The status of Gabriel and Elisa remained hidden and off the grid for many years after this case was opened until a commercial for eBay circulated showing Dearman alongside an older Elisa and Gabriel. In the ad, all three appear to be very happy and in good health, but, I mean, who's to say that's not all for show? It is noted that Ricky Dearman, the father, was actually an actor, so it's hard to say if it wasn't all just an act. It's hard to say, honestly, but from my personal perspective, and this is just my personal perspective, they all look genuinely happy in this video especially Gabriel, who looked very, very comfortable and happy to be with his father. He was smiling. His body language just showed that he was very at ease and comfortable. So, I mean, to me, it didn't seem fake. But then again, I'm not an actor. So maybe you need a body language expert to look into it further. On the other side of the case, to try and prove her innocence and honesty to the public, Ella, the mother, went and took a polygraph test, and she actually ended up passing. Now, we know some people have the ability to pass despite telling a lie, but honestly, why would a mother go out of her way to create such a sadistic scheme to claim her ex-husband was a leader of a satanic cult who sexually abused their children? We know some people are crazy and will say anything to keep their kids from the other parent, but after seeing Ella in interviews, she seems pretty normal for the most part. But then again, people can be very deceitful and deceiving. Both parents, in my opinion, seem to actually have their own issues going on, as as we all do. And this is what makes this case so hard to rip apart, because both sides could very well be the truth. It's just hard to say with the lack of evidence and lack of investigation. There's many people around the world who are fighting for this case to be reopened and further investigating to take place. But at this point in time, it seems all the allegations against Ricky Dearman have been dropped, much to many people's dismay. In my opinion, I believe both sides need to be looked into further to conclude which side was the actual abuser. I have my own opinions, but again, it's an opinion, and I firmly believe more evidence is needed to make any definitive claim. Whether or not the allegations of ritualistic sexual abuse, slaughtering of infants, and cannibalism were real or fictional, it may remain a mystery for many years to come. All we can do at this point is take the evidence that is available to us throughout the videos recorded, the first-hand accounts that have spoken out about the case, and ultimately come to our own conclusions. The saddest part of this case is both the kids' stories remained unchanged and completely the same throughout all of the video's investigative interviews, until it appeared the investigator was actually prompting the kids to say they were lying during their last and final interview. We've seen this many times before where there are false confessions due to the relentless and persuasive implications that the investigator probes the interview is with. Not only was the investigation extremely sparse and didn't appear to collect enough evidence to either prove or falsify the kid's claims, but the investigation was so quickly set to the side, almost as if it was being covered up or brushed under the rug. Both Gabriel and Elisa are on record in many of the videos stating that a lot of people, along with their father, were involved in this satanic cult, some people being very powerful businessmen and politicians in their area. And we all know the more powerful people are, the more things are likely to get swept under the rug. 
Again, this is all just speculation, and based off of the video footage I've seen and all the articles covering the case and the police reports, it definitely seems like something dark and sinister may have been at play here, regardless of whichever side was the truth. Whichever side was the truth, innocent children were abused, and that's the part of this case that is in fact true, and that's what's most horrifying. The things that these kids spoke about that had apparently occurred within the cult are not only mortifying, but they are with such detail and vivid explanations that it makes it hard to believe that the accusations were simply coached by Abraham Christie, especially since there was previous abuse inflicted by Dearman before he and Ella separated. I'm now going to play a quick clip from an interview between Ricky Dearman and BBC. I want you to really listen to what he says in this clip and let it simmer. It was 2014, um, September, and um, I, I, I can't remember how, but I, I, I found out that the police were looking for me. Um, it might have been social services got in touch with me and, 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 uh, and said that you need to go to the police station and, and, I'm, and the children have been taken away from your mom. And I'm saying, why? Why have why they been taken away from the mom? What, what's going on? And they won't tell me anything. I was kind of freaking out a little bit. And what did the police say to you that you'd been accused of? They'd said, I'm OK with what they said. It was, um, it was, um, it's more that it had come from my children. Uh, they'd said, um, I, uh, I'm the leader of a satanic, uh, satanic sex cult a uh, paedophile ring and there's 100 and plus uh, involvement in this including CAFCAS, the police uh, social services uh, the s- school um, uh, and I'm the, I'm the leader of this well, What was your reaction? I mean, did, did well, It's you... difficult to have a, a, a reaction because it's I was all, kind of okay because it's just ludicrous Yes it was the fact that my children had said this. Mm. And what else had they apparently told the police that you'd done? Um, they said that I, my, my children, my two children, eight and nine, <laughs> that, that, um, that I'd um, sexually abused them. And I was selling them to the people. They said by myself, but by the name 60, 70, 80 people. And uh, they said um, that we're killing babies. <laughs> I was shipping them in. And uh, we were cooking. Uh, we were, they, they, were, um, they were showing with their hand movements how I would get their hand on the, on the knives and we would cut the baby's neck, drain the blood and then drink the blood and um, I mean just uh, it's just horrific upon horrific uh, detail. Was it abroad you think where your ex-partner and her new boyfriend filmed your children making these allegations which yeah. were then uploaded onto the internet? Yeah. What, what they did, they beat my kids, uh, they called licks where you get a spoon and you hit the kid. I said a kid. It was in this in this in such instance. It was my two children, and uh, they were told to recount these allegations of what I'd done, or supposed to have done, as well as the, all these other people. This interview with Dearman is one that many people who believe in the cult accusations say is damning to him and shows his supposed guilt. That's subjective, and if you want to see for yourselves, the link is included down below. A lot of people looked at his body language as well as it seemed as if he was falsifying the tears, so that all had a play in what they felt was damning to him and showed his guilt. But again, it's subjective and we can all make our own accusations. Now, although there is a lot of information on the allegations against Dearman, once Gabriel and Elisa stated the accusations were false and their mom and her boyfriend forced them to say those things, more and more information began to come up. It has been reported that once their mother, Ella, began dating Abraham Christie, she became less and less focused on the kids and ultimately revolved everything around her relationship with Christie. 
there's been numerous accounts pertaining to Christie's background being spotty, filled with domestic violence and drug abuse, so it's definitely believable and plausible that he did abuse the kids in horrific ways to force them to say the things that they did. It makes me wonder if maybe those allegations against the father where Ella claimed he would stalk kids and make unexpected visits were actually him just making sure the kids were safe because either way, it seems like Ella had an ongoing knack for picking partners with histories of domestic violence. So there's that. Medical examinations proved that both children had in fact been sodomized and showed signs of physical and emotional abuse. So if it was not their father, it could have very well been Christy inflicting the abuse on the kids and blaming Dearman as a way to show dominance and to try and ruin the life of his girlfriend's ex-husband. As twisted and horrifying as that is, stuff like that does unfortunately happen. So now that we've heard all sides of the story, it's up to you to decide whether or not you believe the original allegations against Dearman were in fact the truth, or if it was actually a horrible, sickening plot conducted by their mother and her boyfriend to try and get back at Dearman for their deteriorated marriage. Most recent news articles and reports claim that it was actually Ellen and Abraham that abused Gabriel and Elisa, and that the two were on the run to try and avoid further interrogation. On a similar note, I also want to mention that in almost every single interview I saw with the mother Ella, she looked absolutely exhausted. Not sure if that's due to her possible guilt of harming her kids, or possibly knowing that Ricky was actually guilty and no one believed her. We may never know what actually happened, and that's the most horrifying part. But either way you cut it, innocent children were abused, and the real monster who caused that abuse will have to carry that guilt for the rest of their lives. This is all the information that I had accumulated on the Hampstead Satanic Sex Cult, and I hope you can look into it on your own as well and decipher what you think to be fact and what to be fiction. The links to everything mentioned in this episode, including the video footage and articles, are all down below in the description box for your reference. Whether or not this was an actual cult, or if it was merely a figment of Abraham Christie's imagination forced upon Gabriel and Elisa in an attempt to demonize their father, the world may never know the real truth. The atrocities that occurred to the two innocent children is what needs to be brought to light. Although cases involving child abuse are horrific and hard to digest, we must bring light to them in an attempt to try and prevent things like this happening in the future. Let me know your thoughts on this case, and feel free to contact me with any questions or suggestions at roguedarknesspod at gmail.com. Or you can always also DM me on Instagram at rogue underscore darkness. The darkness is all around us, and I can confidently say that, Reality truly is more terrifying than fiction. Until next time.